Uh, up on stage with me, we have Dr. Lee Mosbacher, the fourth, Jake Claver, John Wingett, and Connor McLaughlin. Now let's kick things off with the question of the evening. What are the biggest challenges when navigating the early seed investment landscape and what kinds of features and or competitive advantages are necessary for fintech platforms to implement and flourish? I'd love for Lee to kick this off, uh, understanding you are the CEO of Serenis, which is transforming this landscape with your platform. So I know that there are some uh, venture capitalists in the building, so I'm just going to apologize right away. Um, you know, VC is really the troglodytes of finance. Um, we kind of like, um, we, we, our, th our thesis is sort of like shooting from the hip, um, uh, geographic area, domain area. I think the real challenge that um, we have as VCs is how do we perform in a private market that's illiquid? And illiquid markets are, are, are difficult, um, uh, they're, they're silly, they're dumb. How do you um, take what they've done in Vegas or Nate Silver's done in polls? How do you apply that to the early VC landscape? Um, so what we're doing is we're, we're basically creating a predictive poll with 20, 30,000 experts that look at a deal, um, give a score, an investment readiness score, and um, we have $100 million behind us, and we're going to fund the top 5%. And when we do that, um, we can get very large chunks of equity in these early stage ventures. And uh, then we're also creating a marketplace that if you're an investor in one of these, um, that we're a primary market, we're not a secondary market. Um, you can buy and sell your position, and you can start applying other areas of finance to venture capital. Uh, namely the ability to rebalance your portfolio based on whatever uh, hype cycle is coming out of the Bay Area. And then you can also, um, uh, from that, you can start compounding your liquidity multiples over a 10-year cycle, two to three, maybe four times over a 10-year cycle. And what that does is it now allows you to perform like a one percentile fund um, with never hitting a unicorn, never hitting a decacorn, just being average on what Carta would be. And so we think by doing that, um, we're lowering the risk, um, we're opening it up to a whole new class of investor, people that would normally not get, in, get into venture, they may be in the real estate or, or other uh, more, more um, a liquid, more um, shorter term investment uh, profiles. We allow them to expand into venture market and just maybe they get comfortable with a score that's a safe harbor for them and they're able to kind of get in and get out of positions whenever they want, and hopefully that expands the venture market in the United States to um, five, six trillion dollars. I got a question directly for you as well, Jake, if you don't mind. Uh, what role does blockchain technology play in enabling secure and scalable asset tokenization within the private investment landscape? Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier on the previous panel, I think this is gonna have the largest impact on family offices and, and VCs and anybody that's making private investments at scale. So once, um, once this technology gets implemented and has some regulations around it, it's gonna get legs and you're going to see the tokenization of private investments. Securitize is already looking to do this with BlackRock. Uh, they just don't have any liquidity on the other side of that. So you, you have to find buyers. You, you need to become a market maker, right? Uh, a lot of the investment banks have strategic alignment with certain blockchains. Uh, and I think that that's probably where a lot of these private investments and other asset classes will end up being tokenized. Um, but to Lee's point, you, you want to be able to turn your capital more frequently. You don't want to be locked into positions. If Just as an example, we had a deal this last year that we thought was going to be liquid and we would be able to get out of uh, if something went poorly. And uh, we were beholden to somebody else on their cap table and that was not the case at the time, right? So um, if you did have a truly liquid marketplace, that wouldn't have been an issue. We would have been able to de-risk, remove ourselves from that position and um, you know, not have the loss potentially. Uh, not to say it's a loss, but we'll see how it pans out. Right, you never know how private investments are gonna work. Um, and, and like he mentioned, you know, as 
you want to rebalance your portfolio, or even if the investment banks do get involved in a meaningful way, they might be able to underwrite loans against your private investments in ways that haven't existed before. Uh, and I think Lee's, you know, I don't, I don't think he has thought maybe that far, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, the technology in and of itself is going to provide liquidity to private investments in ways that just we just haven't seen in the past. And um, you know, syndicately and, and what some of the things that we're working on um, look to be a leader in that space along with Serenus. Well done, Jake. For you, Connor, how does blockchain influence your role as a, a wealth, uh, wealth advisor for digital wealth partners? And would you be willing to share any investment vehicles or protocols that tickle your fancy? Yeah, so the biggest thing I want people to take away from this entire thing is like blockchain is happening and whether or not you're on the train or you're off it, it almost doesn't matter. The fact that you can't move money instantaneously anywhere in the entire world right now is a massive issue and blockchain technology solved this right now. So there is going to be a massive transformation in the way money moves from point A to point B and we just wanna make sure people are properly exposed to that movement of money. What we're focused on specifically at Digital Wealth Partners is making sure that people understand those protocols that are going to be transformational. You can send a text to anyone in the entire world right now and they have that information instantaneously. You cannot do the same thing for value right now and that's what blockchain is going to change. We want to make sure that not only people are investing in the protocols that are going to be important in this change, but also that people are properly securing their assets in a way where they're not going to run into troubles down the road. Unfortunately, I have conversations every single day of people who found these assets but don't have them properly protected. That's why I couldn't be more happy about us working with Anchorage, one of the few federally chartered banks in the United States who can hold crypto assets and being able to work in tandem with them to make sure their assets are properly secured with the advice on top of that proper security on what assets are going to be transformational. I believe that is a very powerful combination. So I hope everyone at least takes away from this conference that this revolution in the monetary system and how money moves is happening, and we just want to make sure people are not only properly positioned for that change, but also properly securing their assets so when this change happens, they are benefiting from it and not in a situation where they wish they took these appropriate security measures beforehand. Well said, Connor. Give him a round of applause. Alrighty, I'm gonna ask for a forward-looking statement from all of you, but before we shift to that, I've got one question specifically for you, John. How significant of a role do you see fintech companies or tech-enabled platforms like Bank Social playing in the financial lives of your everyday person? Well, they're, they're huge. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard the news today, but or yesterday maybe it was, but the state of Louisiana is now taking Bitcoin and crypto as payment. So it's not coming, it's here. I was talking to the head of TCH, the clearinghouse, that's who's moved money around the United States since 1849, two years after Texas was established. And I asked him a simple question. I said, hey, if I wanna move money to El Salvador, what's the fastest way for me to do that right now? And he's like, uh, I was like, let me answer the question. It's Bitcoin. You can't move it any faster than, and, and Bitcoin's slow, but you can't move it any faster than Bitcoin right now. So that's your answer. Um, you know, FinTech is gonna play a, a made, we, you know, embedded fintech is going to play a major role. And when I say embedded fintech, you know, the, the real idea here is that banks and institutions, financial institutions are starting to understand that the way things are moving, they can't keep up. You know, Chase with an $18 billion budget came up with uh, Onyx blockchain. They can't keep up, you know. Um, they can move in massive tranches of institutional money on their own networks, but you don't need a blockchain for that, right? We're talking about all the rest of the money. And so, because these financial institutions can't keep up, embedded finance is, is quickly becoming a, a major thing. And when we talk about the ownership economy, embedded finance doesn't happen in Robinhood. Embedded finance doesn't happen in Cash App. That's a Web 2 paradigm of finance. What's gonna start to happen is that the institutions will put people 
closer to the rails, closer to the off-ramps, closer to the on-ramps through embedded finance. So what we look at, we do have a, a small investment fund. We've kind, of, we've kind of got what we feel is a good formula for that, which is, you know, you have the, you have the innovators. We try to get in as early as possible, typically pre-seed, seed. You have the early, you know, kind of the guy with the idea. They are rarely the guy who can, who can take the idea and go places. So we pair them with, you know, ourselves and other kind of, uh, you know, accelerator type of uh, partners, but, but we have one critical component that a lot of these other, uh, uh, you know, accelerators or funds don't have. We have the, the embedded finance players who are willing to take, so credit unions, community banks, financial institutions, we've got the players that when we bring them something, they go, oh man, we'll pilot that, we'll try that. So having that trifecta, focusing on embedded finance, focus on you know, who is building this uh, Web3 ownership embedded finance infrastructure that can be quickly ported into these kind of, you know, digital banking. Again, to remind you guys, the CFPB is going to make open banking a thing. It's coming. They're reducing interchange. They're reducing all these things. And so you have to get more efficient. You have to, as a financial institution, you have to get more efficient. You have to get more effective. They're going to start squeezing out these, uh, these third-party Web2 um, you know, intermediaries like the Cash Apps, like the like the Robinhoods, they'll still be around. I don't think they're going to be able to charge the kind of fees they are. The CFPB is quickly cracking down on this, so that's the formula we apply. It's it's been it's been quite successful, and I think uh, a focus on that would would put you in a good position for the future. How do you foresee? And we'll start it off with you, Jake. How do you foresee the landscape of private securities offerings changing as fintech companies continue to innovate in asset tokenization and implement their digital asset strategies? Maybe you could even uh, uh, um, uh, talk about how Syndicately is leveraging SPVs, and you know what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah ST, Yeah, don't want that. Um, definitely. Get, so special purpose vehicles, not sexually transmitted diseases. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, Syndicately um, does end-to-end -end fund administration for SPVs, uh, 506B, 506C, Reg D funds, okay? So boring stuff, uh, but if you want to raise capital in a regulated way, help you do that. Uh, the long-term vision is to be able to tokenize those um, ac really across any reason that you might raise capital. So people syndicate real estate, they syndicate uh, private equity deals, uh, they'll syndicate uh, M&A transactions, um, any reasons you might pool capital from multiple investors, uh, we want to make that super easy for people. Um, and then you, you come into the liquidity issue, right? So a lot of what Lee's put together, uh, you have to orchestrate both buyers and sellers in order to make a market. Um, you have to you know, provide quality investments uh, in that area. Um, Basically, we're looking to be the infrastructure that allows people that have those connections to orchestrate that. And again, you just want to be able to move in and out of things as you want to move in and out of things. Uh, when you see appreciation on something, um, you want to be able to exit if you want to, uh, or you know, if you don't want to lose the allocation, uh, be able to borrow against it. So I, I think a lot of that's coming down the pike. Um, I don't think that many people are discussing a lot of this stuff, um, I think it is going to become relevant uh, very quickly. So I know we're a little over time, but I'll let other people have the final thoughts as well. Yeah, so I've talked about the safe harbor we're providing around predictive scoring. I've talked about the uh, ability to uh, manage your portfolio and have liquidity. But I see the future of VC changing through primarily the fee structure. And if you add just a little bit of math and you add those two other uh, attributes that I talk about, um, I think in the near future, uh, Serenus or Serenus Partners are gonna be able to offer a 0%, 0% and a negative carry uh, in a fund. Um, so if you're a family office or if you're a, a high net worth individual, we get no fees. We make our fees on the buying and selling. Uh, we get in early, we get big chunks of equity, which we can then uh, pass on to you at a discount um, while we still hold uh, a, prime, a big chunk ourselves. And so that's the negative carry. We can sell it to you at 10, 50% discount. Um, and I think that's really unique, but I'm, I'm already seeing fee structure change in VC and uh, I think that's where it's gonna head. Yeah, so I wanna go back to a point that John made. I think it's so important to understand 
we are watching a complete replumbing of the way we move money, and that's not on the front end application that everyone logs into. That's beneath that front end application. Not too many people actually think about, hey, how does money move right now in the financial system? I don't think anyone's ever really thought about that. You log into your bank and you move money. But the transformation we're watching take place is beneath that. It's in the rails of this entire thing. And when you thought, start to understand the transformation at place of the rails of an entire financial system, you're talking about a transformation that takes money from moving two to three days to the matter of a couple seconds. When you start to understand what that could do to a GDP of an entire nation or the entire world, you're watching the velocity of money increase exponentially with the transformation of a single technology being underpinned for that layer of transfer. So this change is happening. I think all of these fintech firms that you mentioned, Robinhood, are going to start utilizing this underlying technology. And I'll just go back to being able to invest in this transformation, being able to securely hold the assets associated with this transformation, and having an expertise associated with understanding what the winners are going to be, are going to be absolutely critical to benefiting from it. So. There's a transformation happening, and I just want to make sure everyone leaves this conversation with the understanding that this transformation is investable, it's happening now, and the largest institutions, BlackRock, Citibank, are all implementing it. You want to get ahead of that. You want to make sure you do not miss out on this next wave. How do I follow that? Man, he took all, he took all my salient talking points. <laughs> now I'm just playing. Um, <laughs> He, he front run me. He front, you front. You guys know what front running is. That's what he just did. If you want a quick explanation of front running, he just did it. Now I'm just playing with you. That, he, he's he's spot on. He's spot on. Um, you know, not much I can add to this other than you know, again, focusing on kind of the the people that are or the the companies that are um, not you know. Nobody really cares about the, the what happens when they press the Uber button. They just want the car to show up and, and pick them up, and they don't care how the money moves and all that kind of stuff. So focusing on people that I think there is some new experience that's left to be tapped out of kind of the front end, um, and we're starting to see that. I think embedded finance is one of those evolutions of kind of a new experience, a new front end, uh, a different modality of a new front end. Uh, certainly, though, the vast majority of the innovation, when you look at why Yahoo failed well, they failed for a lot of reasons, but you know, one of the major reasons they failed, you know, when, when Google came in, uh, they took advantage of big data, they took advantage of things that Yahoo just wasn't getting ahead of, and we're in that moment right now. The companies that, you know, you know I don't know if Robinhood will be around, I don't know if Cash App will be around, but I do know that the next wave of companies will be utilizing these underlying technologies heavily, right, behind the scenes, just like Uber came through and kind of, you know, used the app, the app infrastructure and the, the way kind of you know, devices could talk to to transform that. I think, you know, in this whole this whole idea of ownership, to me, that's got to be a paramount focus of these new these new kind of paradigm shift or the paradigm shift that's happening. If if ownership, because of what the governments are doing, because of the mandates that are coming down the pike, if ownership, if decentralization, if immutability, if um, you know, kind of collusion resistance for these public ledgers is not available. That's what we look at when we evaluate these technologies.